Welcome to the importance of practice from the teachings of Masonius Rufus, vegetarian. Part one of two on words of wisdom. Gaius Masonius Rufus was one of the great Stoic philosophers of the Roman Empire. He lived in the 1st century CE and was born in Volsini, an ancient city of Etruria that is now part of present-day Italy. His philosophy focused on the study and practice of virtue. He believed that everyone is capable of being virtuous, however, people who had not learned the skills of ethical living could not be expected to live without error. Thus, he lived and promoted a simple and frugal lifestyle, which included the learning of self-control modesty, courage, and benevolence. He was a vegetarian and taught that being mindful of one's diet was a vital virtue. His students included Roman noblemen, senators, and future philosophers. In the years following, his wisdom continued to have an impact on later Stoic philosophy as well as early Christian moral thought. Epictetus, another great Stoic philosopher, was his most notable student whose principles were deeply influenced by his mentor. Although the works of Gaius Masonius Rufus are mentioned in the writings of Epictetus, most have been lost through time. However, his philosophical teachings in the form of aphoristic sayings and discourses were preserved by his students. This was later translated and included in Cora E. Lutz's book, Masonius Rufus, The Roman Socrates. Today, we would like to present the discourses, which is more effective, theory or practice, and on training, where the wise philosopher expounds on the importance of enacting the teachings on virtue into our daily life. Which is more effective, theory or practice? The issue arose among us whether, for the acquisition of virtue, practice or theory is more effective. Understanding that theory teaches what is right conduct, while practice represents the habit of those accustomed to act in accordance with such theory. To Masonius, practice seemed to be more effective, and speaking in support of his opinion, he asked one of those present the following question. Suppose that there are two physicians, one able to discourse very brilliantly about the art of medicine, but having no experience in taking care of the sick, and the other quite incapable of speaking but experienced in treating his patients according to correct medical theory. Which one, he asked, would you choose to attend you if you were ill? He replied that he would choose the doctor who had experience in healing. Well then, said Masonius, that being the case in the matter of temperance and self-control, is it not much better to be self-controlled and temperate in all one's actions than to be able to say what one ought to do? Here too the young man agreed that it is of less significance and importance to speak well about self-control than to practice self-control. Thereupon Masonius drawing together what had been said, asked, How now, in view of these conclusions, could knowledge of the theory of anything be better than becoming accustomed to act according to the principles of the theory, if we understand that application enables one to act, but theory makes one capable of speaking about it? Theory which teaches how one should act is related to application and comes first since it is not possible to do anything really well unless its practical execution may be in harmony with theory. In effectiveness, however, practice takes precedence over theory as being more influential in leading men to action. On training, he was always earnestly urging those who are associated with him to make practical application of his teachings using some such arguments like the following. Virtue, he said, is not simply theoretical knowledge, but it is practical application as well, just like the arts of medicine and music. Therefore, as the physician and the musician not only must master the theoretical side of their respective arts, but must also train themselves to act according to their principles. So a man who wishes to become good not only must be thoroughly familiar with the precepts which are conducive to virtue, but must also be earnest and zealous in applying these principles. How indeed could a person immediately become temperate if he only knew that one must not be overcome by pleasures but was quite unpracticed in withstanding pleasures? How could one become just when he had learned that one must love fairness but had never exercised himself in avoidance of selfishness and greed? 
How could we acquire courage if we had merely learned that the things which seem dreadful to the average person are not to be feared but had no experience in showing courage in the face of such things? How could we become prudent if we had come to recognize what things are truly good and what is evil, but had never had practice in despising things which only seem good? Therefore, upon the learning of the lessons appropriate to each and every excellence, practical training must follow invariably, if indeed from the lessons we have learned we hope to derive any benefit. And moreover, such practical exercise is more important for the student of philosophy than for the student of medicine or any similar art. The more philosophy claims to be a greater and more difficult discipline than any other study. The reason for this is that men who enter the other professions have not had their souls corrupted beforehand and have not learned the opposite of what they're going to be taught. But the ones who start out to study philosophy have been born and reared in an environment filled with corruption and evil, and therefore turn to virtue in such a state that they need a longer and more thorough training. How then and in what manner should they receive such training? Since it so happens that the human being is not soul alone nor body alone, but a kind of synthesis of the two, the person in training must take care of both, the better part, the soul, more zealously as is fitting, but also of the other, if he shall not be found lacking in any part that constitutes man. For obviously the philosopher's body should be well prepared for physical activity because often the virtues make use of this as a necessary instrument for the affairs of life. Now there are two kinds of training, one which is appropriate for the soul alone and the other which is common to both soul and body. We use the training common to both when we discipline ourselves to cold, heat, thirst, hunger, meager rations, hard beds, avoidance of pleasures and patience under suffering. For by these things and others like them, the body is strengthened and becomes capable of enduring hardship, sturdy and ready for any task. The soul too is strengthened since it is trained for courage by patience under hardship and for self-control by abstinence from pleasures. When I visited the former, I walked into that farm as a vegetarian and walked out as a vegan. Jason Bolalek, vegan. Blessed viewers, thank you for watching today's Words of Wisdom. 